Next, Jim Cheeseborough is joined by Dr. Michael E. Farku, Director of Cardiology Research at the University of Toronto and Director of Clinical Trials at the Peter Monk Cardiac Center to discuss optimal medical management not achieved in cardiovascular clinical trials. Welcome to Axel, Mike. Thank you very much, Jim. Tell me how you're finding this observation, and it's a very important observation, and it not only relates to research, but it relates to clinical practice. Absolutely. Jim, we've looked at targets for the optimal management of important risk factors, cardiovascular prevention, namely LDL, cholesterol, hemoglobin, A1C, and diabetics, and in systolic blood pressure in many of the clinical trials that have been contemporary trials. And what we have found are trends that are very, very concerning. First of all, the definition of optimal medical management, if we look at the adherence to specific targets, like LDL cholesterol less than 70 milligrams per deciliter in a diabetic patient undergoing coronary revascularization, that for any of these single risk factors, the number of patients being targeted is about 60% only. And overall, it's less than 20%. So we see this in the clinical trials. It's been borne out even in the Barry 2D trial, which in fact was very well conducted with a nurse practitioner model. So we know that even under the best experimental conditions, that patients aren't achieving their goals in these clinical trials. And therefore, you wonder what would the results be if they were, and does this represent the real world or not? And tell me, why do you think, what are the reasons we're not at target? I think there are a number of reasons. First of all, I believe that one of the most important obstacles is our relationship with community doctors. Are we actually educating them as to what risk factor goal attainment really, truly should be? And are they actually following the patients? Because once we see them in a tertiary care center, they go back to their regular attending physicians. And those people need to be better educated. And I think that line of communication, I think, has been a major, major problem. The second issue is the issue of our system itself, of how we reimburse physicians. I mean, we don't really reimburse physicians for following risk factors and, and adhering to those goals. We reimburse them for doing procedures. So the whole way we have the system set up, it works against us on that front. And then there are patient-related factors, such as patients not taking their medications, medication noncompliance. And I think patients also need to be educated because many of them believe once they've had a bypass or a PCI procedure that, in fact, they can do whatever they want, go back to the usual business, to have the same diet and exercise program, and we really have to work with them on that. So this is important to involve a discussion with a primary care doctor oh, no question. about what our goals are, and we all work together to help that. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no question. And I think that's something that we need to do not only in clinical trials, but of course this may be a reflection of what really goes on in the real world, and that's the concerning part of all of this. And then it's the explanation to the patient so that they understand, too, why we're doing what we're doing and Absolutely. that we're trying to help them stay away from doctors and out yeah. of hospitals. Absolutely. This has incredible implications as to the viability of our healthcare system going forward as we grow into this epidemic of coronary disease and diabetes. And then this can affect the outcome of the trial, too. Can it not? I think so. I mean, if you just take an example, if we look at trials of intervention versus bypass surgery, when you look at the proximal lesions that go on to progress, the ones we don't intervene on, the non-target lesions, the 20 and 30 percent lesions that in a bypass situation are bypassed, but in a PCI situation, they're not treated at all. How are they really treated? They're treated with medications. And it really, I think, there will be heterogeneity in the findings of clinical trials mm -hmm. between those who are under control for the risk factors and those that are not. There's going to be differences in the effect size, meaning that patients who are out of control with PCI are unlikely to have the same benefit as they would if they had surgery because of the protection of the vessel. And to explain this even further, we know that the new lesions that may occur tend to be proximal and thus, when there's a bypass, it's already bypassed the proximal part. That's right. Whereas with PCI, when it's proximal, that's a new lesion and could interfere. Absolutely. And there's some evidence to suggest that that actually is what occurs. If you look at long-term follow-up of the Barry 1 trial, they actually showed some of this. So I think that the idea that this medical management, this background therapy, can affect clinical trials is a real phenomenon. 
The other thing that really concerns me, and we saw this in the syntax trial, is that there are disparities in medical management between the two arms, where the PCI arm was treated actually more aggressively than the bypass patients were, for statin therapy, beta blockers, ARBs, and so on. And I think that is also an issue of what we call co-intervention in a trial. What are the other therapies you're giving to the patient that may impact on the primary outcome? The goal should be to have rather similar therapies for both arms. Even though a bypass patient may have it and not see a cardiologist as frequently as they do if they had PCI, it's possible. I think that should be our goal. So I think all of these issues will inform clinical trials going forward. And this is where seeing the patients recurrently throughout the trial to make sure they're still on their medications and following the right procedures and so on is very important. But what we think, Jim, is that this is where we work with the community physicians because, in fact, they're seeing the patients more frequently than we are, and they know the patients better in terms of, you know, are these patients more likely to be adherent or not. I think that the long-term follow-up studies have to track the adherence to medications. We have to do a better job at that. We have a number of tools at hand right now that can help us in this matter, at least to get a handle on this issue of adherence. And I think we're moving in that direction. But I think the message to the practicing docs out there is that we really need to make sure we're prescribing all the efficacious therapies that prevent future cardiovascular events, regardless of what the question is. And we have to all have the same goal for the risk factor control and talk about it so that everybody understands and does the same thing and thus also convinces the patient when we all talk the same way. Yeah. One of the things we've done, Jim, is give the patient a diary from the time that they're enrolled in a study. It's a little book that they carry with them to all their doctors, and they fill out their numbers, and they fill out any issues that have come up in their care. It really helps the patient take a little bit of accountability for their participation in a clinical trial. So that's why we always know people that participate in trials always do better than if they don't participate in trials or better than those that don't. But I think this is one other step towards getting them involved. These are very important observations that not only apply to clinical trials, as you have mentioned, but they apply to our care of the patient and keeping them from having new events. And I thank you for coming to discuss this important observation with us. Thank you very much, Jim. My pleasure.